talk about the trickiest topic in kinematics that we're going to cover this year, uh, this idea of projectile motion in two dimensions. And we're going to break this up into a couple lessons. Uh, the examples take quite some time, so I, I would recommend after seeing a couple, trying your own and then seeing how you did. Uh, but definitely these are going to take some work, uh, so let's get right to it. The first thing I want to remind you of is this idea that in two dimensions, x and y vectors are perpendicular to each other and therefore totally independent. We covered this idea last lesson dealing with a boat going across the river and the idea that any of the horizontal motion that occurs is independent of the vertical motion that occurs. And that is absolutely true in projectiles when dealing in two dimensions. So that is the key feature of this whole deal. If you know a little bit of trig, and in some cases the Pythagorean theorem, uh, you're going to be good to go. Uh, if you don't remember those, I would say go back and take a look at those videos again and make sure you're clear on that before we get at this. But another idea to remember too, when we're dealing with X components, okay, there is no net force working on the projectile in the X and the acceleration is always zero. Okay, so that's a key feature there. The fact that the acceleration is always zero means that we can use the uniform motion equation for velocity. Velocity equals distance over time. That's awesome. Why? Because in many cases, you're going to be given the distance or have to find the distance, and you're going to calculate the time of flight using the y vector. So in this case, this equation is super easy, but you'll notice the conceptual understanding involved in this is quite significant, so make sure you're clear on that. In the y components, however, there is always an acceleration. It's the acceleration due to gravity at a 9.8 meters per second downwards. That's why we put the negative sign in front of it. And because of that, we are instantly pushed towards the big three kinematics equations because that's all accelerated motion. Uh, so you have to realize that these two ideas are independent of each other, yet we're going to need the y components in order to solve for the x components. So this is a key feature again. And finally, the only value that can ever be used on both sides, and this is the big key feature here, is time because it's a scalar. And that's why in most cases you're going to find yourself looking for time over here and then plugging it in over here. And that's pretty much the direction you're going to go. So deal with the Y first, then get into the X, unless you're given values to push you a different way. But definitely in general, that's the way I tend to look. Okay? So... There are three types of projectile problems we're going to see, and it all has to do with the initial setup of the question. We're going to deal with ideas where the projectile is shot horizontally off of a height of some value, and then it goes in its typical projectile motion. We're going to launch it on an angle, and then finally we're going to launch it on the angle off the height of some height h. So the last ones tend to be a little trickier, but I think if you get the first two, uh, certainly the third ones will make more sense. So let's get to the type one types of problems here. A student sits on the roof of their house, which is 12 meters high. She can launch water balloons from a slingshot at 14 meters per second. If she fires water balloons directly horizontally, I want to find out how long it'll be airborne. So if you notice, key word here is horizontally. That means that it's not being launched at an angle. So if we go to draw the picture, uh, here's our pretty little house. And here she is sitting on the roof. And the water balloon is going directly horizontal off the roof and coming to a land. So this vector here is Vx, which is equal to 14 meters per second. Why do we know it's Vx? Because it's horizontal. Uh, we don't know what this distance here is, but we do know that the initial height is 12 meters. So we label it like that, and let's go ahead and put a couple windows and a door. Beautiful. Okay. Now the question we ask is, how long is it airborne? Okay. And when we're dealing with the idea of airborne, we can think about this problem as if it is dropped straight down because remember what's going to happen is as this is falling down you're going to actually pick up speed in the vertical direction which means the initial vertical velocity is what well if it was shot exactly horizontal the initial vertical velocity which we'll call v y naught is just equal to zero it's the equivalent of dropping it 
Now, I know that's a hard thing to understand. Uh, for those of you that watch Mythbusters, I would recommend going to watch them shoot a bullet out of a gun as they're also dropping the bullet. And you'll notice that the fall time is exactly the same, regardless of how fast it's moving horizontally. So we don't know what VY final is. Uh, we do know that the acceleration in the y direction is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And we know that the distance it has to travel in the y direction is 12 meters. Now, negative signs definitely mean direction. And in this case, it's starting at a height of 12 meters, which means the distance it's going to travel is going to be a negative 12 meters. Remember, negative is equivalent to down. And the time is equal to something that we don't know. So if we take a look, we have an initial velocity of acceleration. We have some kind of distance, and we're looking for time. Well, in the big three equations, d is equal to vit plus one-half at squared. And since the initial velocity is 0, we can just rewrite this as d equals one-half at squared. Well, there's the time we're solving for. This is awesome. So if we do the algebra, we find out that time is equal to the square root of 2d over a. And if we plug in these values, the square root of 2 times negative 12 over negative 9.8. So if you take the square root and you notice that you get some kind of error or undefined or imaginary value, that's because you don't have these negatives to cancel out from each other, so watch that. But either way we go, you should end up with about 1.6 seconds. So what does that mean? That means that when she shoots this balloon horizontally from the roof, uh, it will take 1.6 seconds to fall to the ground. So that's the key right there. Right there is flight time. So in general, uh, how long is it airborne only depends on how far it falls in the y direction. Okay? So part B then asks, all right, how far forward will it travel? Okay, so now we're actually trying to find that distance from the house to where it lands. And since we're dealing with things in the x direction, all this relies on is the velocity in the x direction and the time of travel, which means we know our x velocity is equal to 14 meters per second. It's given to us. We know that the distance x is unknown, and we know the time because we just calculated 1.6 seconds. Notice, time is a scalar. You can use it in either situation. And you'll remember the key, key hint is since there is no acceleration in the x direction, we can simply use the equation vx equals distance x over time, solving for distance x, vxt, and plug in the values 14, and 1.6 to give you a distance of 22 meters. So if you've done part A correctly, then part B is super simple uh, because they're independent of each other, but the time of flight is exactly the same. Okay, so now that we've dealt with that question, let's deal with one that's similar and see how we do. A Cutlass Supreme drives straight out of a parking garage at 8 meters per second and hits the water 3.4 seconds later. How far did the car fall? So if we go to draw our picture, we have the car up top, and it drives straight off at 8 meters per second. And what's going to happen is it's going to fall like this, and we're going to end up some distance dx away after falling a distance of dy. Now, in previous examples, we had to calculate what the time was, but in this case, we were given the time. So how do we find dy? Well, let's find out. We know that vy initial has to equal zero. Again, they're independent of each other, so it's just dropping straight down. We don't know what vy final is. We do know that ay is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. We are not sure what dy is yet, but we do know that t equals 3.4 seconds. So we have initial velocity, we have acceleration, we don't have dy, but we do have t. We do know that d is equal to vit plus one-half at squared. Our initial velocity is zero. This distance is just dy, and that's equal to one-half times negative 9.8 
times 3.4 squared, which gives us the final value of negative 57 meters. So in this case, because we already had the time, uh, we were good to go. We could actually find the distance. So we could very quickly use one of the kinematic big three to get to the solution. And how do we know to use a big three? Because we're dealing in the vertical components. So what happens now if we want to find his total impact velocity, both magnitude and direction? Okay, well now we're in a bit of a tricky situation here because we don't have Vy. Therefore, we have to find Vy first, and then we can add up the vectors to get our total velocity plus the direction. So again, what do we know? Well, we know all the stuff that we listed in part A, but in this case now, we can use Vy equals Vy initial plus AT because that is still equal to zero. So Vy is just equal to negative 9.8 times 3.4, which gives you a Vy of negative 33.3 meters per second. Well, now we're getting somewhere because now we have our horizontal vector of eight meters per second. We have our vertical vector which is down at 33.32 and we also have our resultant which we'll call the total. Now you can throw the negative on there if you wish but again we've got things pointing in the right direction so we're fine. Now when we're asking for the final direction we want that angle right there. So let's start off by finding the total. Well Pythagorean theorem says vt squared equals vx squared plus vy squared and if you plug in the values you get 8 squared plus negative 33.3 squared which is going to be equal to 34.3 meters per second excellent so we've got the magnitude let's find the direction and again I would say avoid using your total velocity because we've already calculated the y once. It really doesn't matter in this case, but let's go ahead and use what we have. So in this case, tan theta is equal to 33.32 divided by 8.0, which means theta is going to be equal to 76.5 degrees. Now, if you noticed, you might have left this negative sign in, and if you did so, you ended up with a slightly different answer and that comes the idea of which quadrant uh, tangent can be negative in so the fact that I knew I wanted a angle between 0 and 9 degrees means I didn't bother with the negative sign here uh, so I have these two values which means what do I get as a solution well I get that the final answer is 34.3 meters per second 76.5 degrees below horizontal. Now you might ask, well, why did I say below horizontal in this case? Because we've made no determination of what south is and what north is, and if you think about the way this is dropping, uh, it's not necessarily traveling south, because if you look over top of the car, well you could say, well, it's actually traveling down. So below horizontal is a nice and easy way to come up with your angle. So now let's say instead of launching horizontally at a velocity, we actually give it an angle uh, when we launch it. So let's look at this. The Dukes of Hazard are traveling at 85 kilometers per hour when they hit a jump that makes an angle of 25 degrees above the horizontal. The first thing we need to do is find the total time. Uh, when you think of total time, think of the vertical component. So we know that if we draw the picture, let's say that they have a ramp, and there's the car right there, and it's going this way, 85 kilometers an hour, and it's going to fly, and let's say we set up a ramp on the other side, and it's going to land right there. We're going to have some distance dx, and we're also going to have this distance dy which is going to give us the maximum uh, height of flight. And one thing I would like to point out is the fact that at its maximum height, uh, the direction of the velocity vector is exactly perpendicular, and that may be useful later on. So how long are they airborne? 
Well, we know that we have this vector right here and 85 kilometers an hour we need to convert into meters per second. So 85 kilometers an hour divided by 3.6 is equal to 23.61 meters per second. So we know that this is 23.61 meters per second. We know that it has two components. It has Vx and Vy. All right. We know that this is 25 degrees. So if we want to find Vx, we know that the cosine of 25 degrees is equal to Vx over Vt. So Vx is equal to Vt cos 25, which equals 21.4 meters per second. If we're looking for Vy, we know that the sine of 25 degrees is equal to Vy over Vt. So Vy is equal to Vt sine 25, which gives you a final velocity of 9.9 .98 meters per second. Uh, if you take a look at these equations, uh, if you substitute the 25 with a theta, those are your general equations for taking an angled vector and finding its components. You could actually use those equations just as is with whichever angle you're given and you'll be just fine. So we have these components now. Uh, we need to solve for the time. Well in this case we go right back to what we know. We know that when we're dealing with time we're dealing with the y components. So if we can find out how fast it is traveling at the top, we should be able to find our half time and then we can just double it to get our full time. So uh, if we know that our initial y velocity is equal to 9.98 meters per second and we know that our final y velocity is zero, uh, we know our acceleration in the y is negative 9.8 meters per second uh, we don't know what dy is, but we also don't know what time to the top is. So remember, this is symmetric. Now, is there a way to get this in one calculation? Yes, and if you remember, I implore you, go ahead and use it. But I'm going to show you the brute force way of doing it. So we have initial, we have final, we have acceleration, and we're looking for time. Vy is equal to Vy0 plus At. We know this is equal to zero. Let's solve for t. And t is equal to negative 9.98 divided by negative 9.8. And that's going to give you a time of 1.018 seconds. So the time to get from this spot right here to the top is one point. 018 seconds. So by exploiting the symmetry of the parabola, we know that total flight is equal to 2 times 1.018, which is equal to 2.036 seconds, which is just 2.0 seconds. So there you have it. Uh, by finding the component of your initial vector, uh, you are able to find the flight time and I, I have a feeling you're figuring out where this is going. So let's do part B. How far forward do they fly through the air? So in this case what are we looking for? We're just looking for dx. And do we have vx? Well yes, we found the component. It's 21.4 meters per second. And do we have time? Absolutely, we just found it. It's 2.036 seconds. So in our case, velocity x equals dx over t. Solve for dx equals vxt, which is equal to 21.4 times 2.036, which is going to give you a distance of 43.57 meters, or just 44 meters. So if we ask a question like, what is their max height? Uh, we already have the half time, uh, but we don't need it anymore because we can find the distance using the velocities that we've calculated as well as the acceleration. So we have the Vy initial 
that's equal to 9.98 meters per second. We know at the top, Vy is going to be 0 meters per second. We don't know what distance is. We do know what time is, but I'm not going to write that down because we also know that acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. We have Vf, we have Vi, we have A and D. Vy squared is equal to Vyi squared plus 2AD should get us the solution. Solving for D, that's equal to Vy squared subtract Vyi squared divided by 2a. And now if we plug in the values, that's going to equal 0 squared subtract 9.98 squared divided by 2 times negative 9.8 and that's going to give us a value of 5.1 meters. So this crazy driver is officially 5.1 meters off the ground. So a quarterback launches a ball to his wide receiver by throwing it at 12 meters per second at 35 degrees above horizontal. How far down field is the receiver? So we have the football right here, and we have our pretty stick man right there, and he is throwing the ball in a parabolic motion towards the receiver who is so excited that he is catching the ball. Okay, well, we have this distance here, which is dx. We know that this is dy max. We know that the initial velocity is equal to 12 meters per second. And we also know that this angle here is 35 degrees. Okay, so if we're trying to find how far downfield the receiver is, we know from experience now that the first thing you have to do is find the time and then using that time you can find the distance in the x direction. So the first thing we need to do is find the components of the velocity vector. We know that it's 12 meters per second and we know that there's going to be two components Vx and Vy and we know that this angle is 35 degrees. We know the equations from a previous question so I'll state it outright Vx is equal to Vt cosine of 35, which is equal to 9.83 meters per second. And we know that Vy is equal to Vt sine of 35, which is equal to 6.883 meters per second. So in order to find time, we know we have to use the y components. But as I said, I'm going to give you a little reminder of something we did in one dimensional, and that's exploiting this parabolic motion. We know that whatever initial velocity happens at the beginning, the negative of that is what happens as its final velocity. So if our Vy initial is 6.883 meters per second, then Vy final should be the negative of that value because it is a perfectly symmetric parabola. We know that acceleration is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second, so t is equal to the value we don't know. So if we plug this in, Vyf is equal to Vyi plus at. Solving for t, t is equal to Vyf minus Vyi divided by a. And if we plug in these values, we get negative 6.883 subtract 6.883 divided by negative 9.8, you're going to get a time of 1.405 seconds. So the total flight time of the ball is 1.405 seconds. Well, why is that important? Because now we can find dx. We know that vx is equal to 9.83 meters per second. We know that we don't know what dx is, and we know that the time, the total flight time is equal to 1.405 seconds. So dx equals vxt, which equals 9.83 times 1.405, which is equal to 14 meters traveled. So we now know a quick way to get the total flight time which can then lead us into finding out exactly how far it's traveled horizontally. So when we take a look at how high the ball goes, 
we know again that if we're dealing with max height, we're dealing with the y components, and we have all the velocities, and we also have the acceleration. So if we have vy initial, which is equal to 6.883 meters per second, we know that at the max height, the velocity is 0 meters per second. We know the acceleration is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared, but we don't know what dy is. And we know this is going to give us the max because at the max height, the velocity is instantaneously zero. So now we can use vf squared equals vi squared plus 2ad. Solving for d, we get dy is equal to vy final squared minus vy initial squared divided by 2a. And plugging in the values, we get zero subtract 6.883 squared divided by 2 times negative 9.8 giving us a total height of 2.4 meters. So we know again because we've established VY final as 0 that this is also going to be the max height so we've completed part B just like that without using any other calculated values except for the components of the velocity. So if we're asked a question like this, at what other angle could the quarterback have thrown the ball and reached the same displacement? Uh, for the case of physics 11, I'm just going to state this fact. For those of you in physics 12 or perhaps in honors class, uh, you're going to want to take a look at trig identities and how they play a role. But what I will say is this, that complementary angles have the same range. And what does complementary angles mean? Well, that means angle 1 plus angle 2 is equal to 90 degrees. So if we know that angle 1 is equal to 35 degrees, the complementary angle to 35 is 55 degrees. So therefore, 55 degrees will give the same range. Now, I know for some of you, this is an explanation that bothers you because I've given you no proof behind it. But like I say, go back and take a look at your trig identities and see how cosine and sine relate to each other. And when you see that, uh, you should know why this is true. But for the rest of you, uh, if you're happy just to take this as fact for now, uh, we're all happier for it. Okay? So we've gone through it. This is type 1 and 2 projectiles where you're launching it horizontally off a height or you're launching it at some angle. Um, they're quite tricky and they take a lot of finicky type math, but if you keep all of your numbers organized, you should have no problem in solving these questions. So give these a try and we'll talk to you again.